morning, everyone, and thank you for taking time to join us. I'm Jay Sicht, Managing Editor of ABRN, and today we're going to be talking with collision repairers, the trials and tribulations of our industry. I'm pleased to have joining me today these esteemed panelists. With us today, we have Cheryl Bosley, our Systems LLC, Rob Grieve, owner of Nylon's Collision Center in the Denver area of Wood, Colorado. James H. Wilson II, principal owner of ICS Collision Center in which is, and Kai Young, president of European Motor Car Works Incorporated in Costa Mesa, California. I just got a message here that I got a little un unstable internet connection. I apologize for that. I'm on a wired connection when it's tested at 20. Um, let's start with taking the temperature of your business environment. How are things going for each of you at the moment? And uh, Rob, if you don't mind, start us out with that. Sure thing. <clears throat> First off, thanks for having me here today. I appreciate it. And uh, it's wonderful to hang out with all the rock stars on the call. So thank you, everybody. Um, I, I would say business temperature is like, you know, for the last two years, we've had the flu and now we have a nagging cough that won't go away. Uh, and uh, but, Overall, I'm optimistic uh, about what's, you know, what's going on and business is improving, uh, but uh, challenges abound and they, they keep moving and changing and uh, you never know what uh, you're going to get presented with next, to tell you the truth. James, you look like you might have something to say. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'll... I'll mirror what Rob said earlier. Uh, yeah, thank you for the invite today. It's a real honor to be here amongst uh, esteemed colleagues and uh, those true professionals in our industry that are trying to make a difference. Uh, yeah, in regards to that, that's a great question. Our business environment, it's, uh, like I said, I'll agree with Rob on many points there. It is a constantly moving target. Um, and the fact that we've just come through this pandemic situation, uh, I believe we're all pretty much on the same page in regards to uh, our daily struggles, be it supply chain issues, uh, technicians, things of that nature. And so we are, we're a little more of a niche market. And so with us, our business is really doing well in the sense that we're booking out probably three months in advance. Uh, but uh, I think we're going to dive into some of the other issues coming up and the questions you have later. Back to you, Rob, or Jay. Hi, right. would you like to weigh in? Sure. Um, thanks for having us and uh, really, really glad to be here. You know, we always try to maintain a positive outlook, but like what James and Rob alluded to, it's, it's the unknown. And coming out of the COVID situation, it's hard to break old habits. We still have a, a hygiene issue here where we're still making appointments for customers to be uh, in the reception area one at a time. You know, it's just just that safety aspect. And it's, it's definitely the consumer confidence, you know, it's, is, is an issue. We're, we're noticing that uh, people are not driving as much in our area. Usually it's packed going home at night and with the fuel prices as they are, there's just not as many people on the road. And obviously we went through that with COVID where obviously if they're not driving, they're not crashing. So that affects our business. Personally, our outlook's uh, really good. Uh, we've added two new manufacturers to our uh, structural certifications. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of these situations where we have to keep up with technology and, and try to solicit the consumers that are you know, headed in certain directions. And right now, EV is a, a real popular item. So that's where we're at. Cheryl, how about you or your company or your customers for that matter? Great. Well, thank you again for um, having me today. I'm excited to be here um, and talk about these important topics. I have to say overall business is, you know, great, but um, it's a really challenging time. And I've been in the industry since the late 90s. And I think this is probably the most challenging time that I've faced and we faced um, from a number of different areas and definitely supply chain issues um, causing several issues you know, with our customers in terms of not being able to get the parts timely. Um, 
labor shortages, hiring the team to bring them on, you know, on staff. Um, and then just the cost of repairs is definitely going up. Technology has changed so much. And to be really on top of the changes and to make sure that we're performing safe and proper repairs, you know, according to the manufacturer guidelines, those expenses have gone up to do that. Um, and we're not necessarily being compensated to do that. So um, definitely a lot of challenges. Um, I think our future is bright in this industry, you know, as we work together. But, um, you know, there's just a lot to, lot to work on these days, for sure. Sure. Um, Kai, you mentioned adding two new, two new manufacturers to your structural certification. What has been the toughest part of that? that process? I guess uh, the manufacturer is actually getting up to speed. Uh, a lot of the data is not available. They're still doing a lot of the OEM procedures. Uh, if it wasn't for personal relationships, you know, making the phone call and saying, hey, we got an issue here. Uh, we don't have any procedures and having them, you know, ask mm -hmm. their uh, technicians on site what's going on, actually send individuals down to the shop <clears throat> and repair mm -hmm. the vehicles with us. Uh, oh. that, that's usually uh, uh, the case right now since, since they are so new. Agreed. <clears throat> Cheryl, you mentioned um, the supply chain shortages. What have your customers found to be successful strategy for attacking those, handling those? Well, you know, gone are the days where we could order the parts and you know, get them within you know, 24 hours. Um, and with our process, we do a complete disassembly and order all the parts up front one time. So it's really been a challenge in terms of bringing in the vehicles to do a complete disassembly and then not really know, you know when we're going to get those parts. So we really tried to step in front of it and understand what the timing is for several of the parts. And we have one car where the parts took almost a year for them to arrive from the manufacturer. So we, before we do the complete disassembly, we try to understand, you know, are, there, are those parts available? Are we going to be able to get them, especially for those drivable vehicles? And if at all possible, we secure the parts from a dealership. So we go ahead and secure them for the drivable vehicle before we bring in the vehicle. Um, and we'll also pay more to get parts from other markets. We'll pay overnight fees to get those parts in. We utilize our network um, and send out messages. Does anyone, you know, have availability or know how, you know, we can get these particular parts? And because customers are on edge these days, they want their vehicles back. Um, many customers don't have rental car coverage, and they don't even realize that, or they only have mm -hmm. it for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. So we really try to educate our customers too, um, so they understand what the supply chain looks like, and also try to educate them about their their rental car coverage as well. And to follow up on that, then educating the customer up front is the way to go. I mean, it's a lot easier to explain that now. Rental coverage runs out because there's a parts delay, right? So you right. prepare their expectations. Exactly. Okay. Rob, how about your shop? How, how, how are you handling that? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we, we try to specialize in a few different brands like Lexus is our number one uh, vehicle followed by Toyota. So we're, we know what's available and what's not available it makes it a little bit easier. Um, I mean, Cheryl's team has got an amazing process down and, you know, these types of things have got to be a, a gigantic interruption to the just step-by-step -step processes you have, uh, you know, yeah, we come. We want to tear the car down too, but we don't want to tear it down and make it immobile if we can't get parts for, you know, for however long. The other thing I'm finding is, <clears throat> you know, we build these loyalties with with dealerships, uh, 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 buying parts from them for years and years, and the relationships that we have with the parts people and stuff. Uh, but some dealers don't want to talk to other dealers, and if they don't have it then it's on back order. But if you pick up the phone and call another dealer, they may have the part that you need to get the thing out the door. So oh. now, mm -hmm. now it's about doing a lot of research and not just accepting the first answer <laughs> anymore. Rob, are you, is that requiring just the old fashioned <laughs> phone call or is there, are there any um, websites or 
that you use to, to research for parts availability? You know, Mike Anderson put out an article not too long ago, uh, maybe a couple of months ago, that had some uh, different places. I haven't found any, any luck with those myself for what I'm looking for. <clears throat> I'm an old fashioned guy, you know, pick up the phone and let's talk to somebody because building relationships is incredibly important for me. Sure. James, how about you? Absolutely. Well, to build on what Cheryl and Rob have already started, um, I want to touch base back on the rental vehicle side. So yes, what we're seeing in our market is rental cars are simply not available. Mm -hmm. so that adds, I see you guys shaking your head, that yeah. adds the next level of frustration for clients. And so even if it's a non-drive vehicle, we're still working with those rental relationships, trying to see how soon we can get them into a car. Um, a lot of times it's two or three weeks if we're lucky. So that's one of the dynamics uh, impacting what we're dealing with. And then, um, yeah, coming back to uh, what Rob was saying about it ties in the severity. Uh, if you get a hard hit vehicle and you want to do 100% blueprint and break it down beyond the damage, and you don't want to turn it into a non-driver. Uh, something that we're seeing in our market as well, perhaps you guys have seen this, uh, we were working on a late model, um, all aluminum F-150, and we needed to replace the upper rails, both left and right side. We were able to acquire every piece of metal for the vehicle, except for the self-piercing rivets. And then yep. on top of that, they weren't available. On top of that, there was a recall. On top of that, Ford could not provide us with any secondary repair procedures. Like Cheryl was saying, we're focused on safe and proper repairs. And as humble service providers, we, we always rely on the engineers who design that vehicle. And so when we call our Ford dealership and they don't have answers, and then Ford is not able to provide us documentation, we had a perfectly good truck that we were ready to repair, but since we could not get the rivets and we could not get information from the Ford engineers, insurance made the decision to total it up. So you know, we do our best to, to uh, minimize those situations, but like we all said, it's a new world that we're in. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to touch on the, the supply or the, uh, the dealers, um, like Rob says, I'm relational as well. So it's always easier to pick up the phone, reach out to your dealerships and see if they would, um, acquire that part from another dealer. I think Cheryl said as well, we're paying, you know, um, we're shortening our margins because we have to pay a higher price to acquire the part. And then beyond that, the overnight shipping, and things mm -hmm. of that nature. Um, and so coming back to myself, lastly, uh, I think you'd asked the question mm -hmm. about what types of networks or things that we're using. Um, I'm part of an organization. It's, uh, I think it's safe to say it in here. It's uh, BNI, Business Network sure. International. Mm -hmm. And so we have roughly 285,000 global members. And so the beauty is if I have an issue on obtaining parts or I need something manufactured, I literally have contacts around the world, everywhere from Hong Kong to Malaysia, to India, to Argentina. So that's what I use is my global network. And it's like, hey, you're in the country, who do you know? And sometimes almost reverse engineering that, that has allowed me uh, to build those relationships that Rob had discussed earlier and create an alternative supply chain that we normally wouldn't have. So in other words, just call you to get the parts. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> You're always welcome to text me, my friend. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Kai, do you have any additional perspective on that? Oh, yeah. Uh, we dealt with an OE that invented the term, uh, you know, supply shortages. Uh, hmm. many, many years ago, um, we opened a facility just to handle that product brand. And fortunately, at the time, when vehicles came in, we were just used to doing the same repairs. So I would order a dozen left headlamps, a dozen right headlamps, dozen front bumpers, dozen rear, and kind of created the national back order around the country because I had all the parts. So, you know, flash forward now that we do, 
you know, have this supply chain shortage, we still like Rob, you know, specialize in like five product uh, lines. And many of them have the same, you know, issues. We know what, when we're going to get apart, when it's available. So we try to stock all the one-time use fasteners, all the things that we know they're going to be a problem. And like what Cheryl alluded to, you know, try to qualify the customer up front, let them know what the problems may be. And no matter how much you can pre-order, sometimes when you do do the blueprint, things come up. And so in our case, if we do take a vehicle apart and it has a lot of different items that are missing, like a window regulator or something like that, sometimes we button the car up and give it back to the consumer because obviously, you know, our customer satisfaction is everything. Their experience has to be good. And to, to have a car taken apart and sitting in a lot for two months is not good, especially when they run out of rent a car. So it's a case by case situation. And uh, we just obviously try to, you know, remember that uh, the consumer, you know, is our customer and we just want to make this as painless as possible. Thank you about, thank you everyone for that. Um, shifting gears just a little bit, Kai, what are some of the latest technologies in your business? I know, I know that you've plunged headlong into EV repairs as an example, so. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the main things is, you know, shop infrastructure. Uh, as more EVs hit the road, shops are going to have to be ready, you know, with some kind of power supply to charge these vehicles. Obviously, they they have uh, battery loss while they sit. Uh, it's a situation where, unlike a gas vehicle, when you return it, it you know, customer leaves it with a half a tank of gas, they get it back with a half tank of gas. In our yeah. case, if cars are here for a long period of time, you know, we give a courtesy, uh, obviously, you know, uh, charge when we deliver the car so that it is full but depending on where the car is located is going to be a situation if you if you have a charge port in a certain part of the shop sometimes it's difficult to get to obviously you try to charge at night when the power is a little cheaper uh wi-fi is a big thing with the telematics nowadays uh, these cars are talking all the time we've got information going back and forth so uh, those are things that that a shop should have uh and and obviously have that situation available. So wherever a vehicle may be uh, having an update or software, uh, things like that, that it has a good Wi-Fi connection. The other thing too, because we're dealing with high voltage, you know, segregating a period of the shop or area of the shop so that when these cars are apart, there's a safety issue so that people don't obviously touch something they're not supposed to touch. So it creates a challenge on, on how you do, do a layout on a vehicle. Uh, you know, and where you put in the shop when you're waiting for parts or batteries out and where you store the batteries. But really to answer your questions about technology, you know, ADAS is such a big thing right now with the calibration. You got sensors, you know, that have radar, sonar, LIDAR. Every manufacturer has a different technique. And uh, obviously it's such a challenge for this industry to, to have these things available so that you can, you know, put a consumer back into a vehicle safely. So, you know, our big thing is we try to do everything in-house uh, for the shop owners on the call. You know how frustrating it is when you depend on a third party. I mean, you could promise a car on Friday and if it has to go to a dealer to have something recalibrated, reset, it, you just get in line and it could be a week, two weeks sometimes to get the vehicle back. So we try to invest in all the latest things that, that make our life easy uh, and, you know, moving forward. Uh, it's just one of those situations where uh, if we need it, we, we try to purchase it and do it in-house. Would you be able to just offhand name one piece of equipment or a small tool that's provided? The uh, we the we actually company? acquired a TruePoint uh, situation, uh, you know, um, with Rob, I see Rob kind of snickering. <laughs> so, you know, this is a, actually pretty neat because uh, it doesn't use up a lot of shops space for calibration. You can have uneven floors. It's not as susceptible to reflections in the shop. Uh, not as, not as uh, sense, the sensors aren't obviously uh, critical if you have some steel in the way, like a steel support beam or something. So we find it really user-friendly. Uh, so that's the latest thing that we've, we put in the shop. Hi, did you find that you needed as much space as what we've typically discussed as needed? Fortunately, when we built this new facility uh, in 215, yeah, we kind of allocated an area for that. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's obviously a nice place to put cars to that aren't getting picked up, but it, it, at least we have access to it. We can move some cars around and have that area. Okay. Anybody else would like to go next about technology? Um, I will. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, so one of the things that we really, we started working on before the pandemic, but then when COVID kicked in, we really started working on our, what we call our DCR claims portal. And um, when COVID hit, we really didn't want our insurance adjusters, you know, walking around in the shop and um, part suppliers. We really wanted to minimize our team's exposure to germs and our customers' exposure. So we really started working more so on our claims portal and our claims portal it's a cloud-based system where we load our work order, all the work instructions, our estimate, everything that we're doing to repair the vehicle. And for each line, the estimate, we link the documentation. So like the OE procedures on how to repair the vehicle, videos, voice files, pictures, invoices, everything that really builds that file that shows why we repaired the vehicle that way and the evidence that shows how we repaired it so that uh, we could send the link to our insurance adjusters and to the customers. So they could actually click the link and say, this is how we repaired your vehicle. This is why we repaired your vehicle this way. And here's all the documentation showing that we repaired your vehicle this way. Um, and it's actually more efficient than, you know, for example, an adjuster coming into the shop and looking at a point in time, looking at the vehicle at a point in time and, you know, digging through paper to see an invoice because we've got everything documented, the pictures, everything. And, they can honestly sit at their desk anywhere and see all the documentation that they need. And then for the customers too, it gives them peace of mind because they can see everything that they need to see along the way and how we repaired the vehicle. And so, although it was something we were working on really before COVID, with COVID, we really just said, this is something that's really important to our business and something that we want to provide. And, um, and so it's kind of all hands on deck now with our, with our claims portal. It's a brilliant system. James, I could, yeah, would you go yeah, ahead? Yeah, no, um, yeah, I'll, uh, I want to tie back in with uh, what Kai was mentioning earlier about EV and making sure you have that inner structure, if that's the direction that you are choosing to take your business. Um, we're actively uh, moving that direction where we're at. And so I've been reaching out to um, our uh, electric provider in the market because in some parts of the state and, and each state's different, there are different programs that are available to help offset your installation cost for exterior charging stations. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole uh, process of going through that. Uh, but like I said, depending on the state, if that is something that business owners are looking into, they should definitely consider that reaching out to those electric providers and say, hey, if we're going to have a mutually beneficial relationship here, so to speak, you know, how can you help me offset the cost of in by installing two or three charging stations? You know, and the added value for that, um, my perception is that would for one, that would attract more EV owners to our facility because right. the others in our area do not provide just a charging station. And so even if you don't work on their vehicle immediately, six, nine, 12 months later, when that opportunity comes up, they'll be like, you'll be top of mind because they bring their vehicle to your place to charge it, whatever, once a week, things of that nature. And then, um, yeah, I completely gapped out the, uh, the Wi-Fi side of that Kai. Um, yeah, making sure that you have that uh, extended, which we've done in our shop, so we cover a larger area for the vehicles that do require those updates and that constant connectivity. Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing that with this guy. That was, a, that was a great reminder. But yeah, those are just a couple of things that we've done in our facility. And I kind of followed suit with what Kai's doing. I'm naturally always late to the party, but uh, we, we got a building next to us. Uh, and, and are renovating that to do exactly what Kai did. My, my vision is it's the, it's the pre-place where a car goes for its pre-scans and, and the, uh, you know, a pre-alignment check and uh, maybe a 
pre-measurement with the point X or something like that. Uh, and then maybe inspections and so on and so forth. Um, but the true point, you know, that's not something I would have run out and bought, but because we're part of the manufacturer program needed it. I'm, I'm, it's a, it's a great piece of equipment and we're learning to do all sorts of new things that, uh, you know, that we would normally send to the dealer. But like we were saying before, you know, they're having the same problems that we're having with employees and parts and all the rest of that. And it, it's very unpredictable and we need to find some way to add some predictability back into our business for the consumers. Yeah, well said, Rob. Yeah. yeah it, and just to pick up on what everyone else said too, you know, we're, we've been using an outside vendor that's been coming into our shops to handle a lot of the calibrations, but we're also moving towards that, realizing that um, it's something that we need to be doing in house. And so that's also something that we're working on and we have a true point on order, so. <laughs> right. <clears throat> uh, I like I like to mention that you know, along with what Cheryl just said with the outside vendors and obviously using dealers is you know we still inherit that liability, mm -hmm. so that's always a risk factor that we have to consider whether or not that happens. Or not. We we've sent things to the dealer and haven't come back where where it wasn't done right, uh, where some of the things were done and not all the things were done. So those are situations that are frustrating. So like like to my statement before we can handle it in-house uh, we definitely try to do that amen kai yeah great point kai i just want to follow up with you on that um the, yes the dealers when we're subletting um it's a bit concerning to i think most of us when we know what calibrations and things are required and necessary whereas the dealership doesn't I don't know if you guys have experienced that in your market, but we'll send the car to them and say, hey, here's what we need to do. Here's what needs to be calibrated. And they'll, the service manager advisor will call up, oh, no, you don't need to do that. Yet we have the documentation for their vehicle that says otherwise. So that's, yes. I think there's a, a lagging in the education side of, I think maybe we just all in our industry have a heightened sense of awareness um, as opposed to perhaps what's going on at the dealership, maybe it's a little more of a trickle down effect over there. Yeah, that's a good point, James, because some of the certification programs that we're on, you know, we have two alignment machines in house and just to be able to handle the, the volume and they have to be recalibrated every year with, with our certifications, you know, even our lifts have to be calibrated along with torque wrenches and things like that. So, you know, I don't know how the dealerships do it, but our fear is when we used to send alignments out, you know, when was the last time that alignment machine was calibrated? And so, you know, that's, it starts with square one. If it's not straight to begin with, everything else, you know, falls in line. So that's a great point, yeah. Dave. By the way, your measuring systems for the frame machine require the same, you know, mm -hmm. yearly calibrations and certificates as well, even torque wrenches for heaven's sakes, you have to be calibrated. So there's, there's a lot to keep your, your finger on the pulse. And to piggyback on what everybody else was saying, it, it just seems as though our responsibility keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger because while we're trying to teach our people what to look out for and what the vehicle actually needs and the different systems that are gonna to need to be addressed, now if we send it to the dealer, we have to teach them how to do it yeah. and, uh, and make sure you get it back uh, proper because that's, that's our responsibility to the guest. Sure. Right. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions here from the audience. We were talking about leaving those to the end, but since this one is on, does paint application with ADAS technology present any calibration or functionality challenges? Uh, I guess I would start by just always just check the OEM repair procedures to see where a repair or refinish is allowed because some of them allow you to do a repair certain distance a sensor, the blind spot monitor, and some, you just the total replacement, right? And I know the paint manufacturers are testing certain, some of the high metallic, uh, some of the high metallic finishes are causing just a little bit of um, accuracy um, deviations, I guess. They're, so they're working on some new formulas, some, some of the aluminum metal flake with other other products like glass or, or some kind of synthetic mic 
like that. So um, any feedback from, from you guys on that? I like to go with that, Jay. Um, you know, when, when we do check in a vehicle, uh, I don't know how many people out there check mill thickness. Uh, you know, generally speaking, that repair area, we will check that during the, the repair process simply because it could have been repaired prior to us. Uh, it could have a clear bra on it. It could have all kinds of different coatings. Sure. So those are situations that uh, if there's an unknown to begin with and, and you go in to touch that vehicle uh, and even follow the OEM procedures, uh, that area of a sensor that might not be in the repair area, let's say on a bumper, you can deliver it back with, with something that's inferior. So it's, it's, you got to be really cautious nowadays not only to follow the OEM procedures, but to check the vehicle, obviously, to see if any previous repair, repairs have been done. Sure. Anyone else have anything to add on that? I think it's something you got to really pay attention to these days when, when, you know, the big thing was for the longest time, you know, pain ain't going to kill you. Well, today... It yeah. might be a little bit different. There's there's some manufacturers that say if it's any of these particular colors, replace the part. Yeah. Don't even repaint it. Um, you know, with uh, some of the distance sensors and uh, ultrasonic sensors, stuff like that that are in the bumpers, uh, they need to be relearned. If you take them out and paint the bumper and put them back in, now there's a process that you need to go in there and retell the car where they are. Uh, it, there's, there's just so much to know about, uh, that question anymore. You have to go into the procedures, uh, and, and some of these cars are, are coming with some real high level clear coats on them. And you, you know, our job is to put it back to the way it was before. And if it's got the uh, ceramic clear on it, well, you need to know that and put ceramic clear back on it. Yeah. I think the difficulty that we have, um, you know, we, we have a lot of customer pay and we all have a tendency to live in the past. So where a front bumper job might've been a thousand dollars, now it's $2,500 because of all of the yep. calibrations you have to do. Uh, you know, it's an eye opener, especially if you, you know, people don't have accidents every year and we, we may get somebody that hasn't had one in 10 years come in and go, I can't believe what the expense mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. to have my car repaired. Right. Right. So this next one, let's talk about insurers. What's working and what's not with those interactions, Jay? That's an outstanding question, Jay, <laughs> that I would love to elaborate on. <laughs> However, I'll, I'll try to keep it to a minimum for you. Um, I'd like to preface this first by stating that I view my job as an educator so when potential clients walk in through my front door, it's my job or my team's job to sit down, actively listen to them and make sure we're able to manage their expectations. I think everyone on the panel would agree. That yeah. is the key to everything that we do now is managing our clients' expectations or potential clients, I should say, because whether they choose to use us or not, and I'm a realist and I understand, I acknowledge that the majority of the people that walk in through my front door are not my client, but if I can help them navigate that path so they leave here able to make an informed decision, then I've done my job because I believe everyone on this call is focused on a safe and proper repair. Mm -hmm. And so that being said, um, I, I make sure I acknowledge that. I remind them that we have not only a legal, but a moral obligation to ensure that they arrive home safely because our vehicle repairs were performed properly, reasonably, and, and ethically. So as we move on to insurers, generally speaking, this is our process, and perhaps other business owners on the call do this as well. Um, what we do is once the vehicle comes in, we, we go through the repair authorization, we blueprint the vehicle, do the 100% do the teardown. We first send our damage repair assessment to our client with the image report, and we review all of that with them first. We answer any questions they may have, and then with their permission, we will go ahead and send that on to their insurer for review. Because um, last I knew, I don't sell insurance. I'm a vehicle repair professional. 
the insurers sell insurance, they don't repair vehicles. I think we can all agree on that point. Um, so I have a contract with our clients. And if they use a third party payer, such as the insurance company or a credit card, it's one and the same, quite honestly. So once we have that approval and we've answered all their questions, then I'll go ahead and submit that to their insurer for review. We're very transparent. So I carbon copy everyone that needs to be on, on the uh, email. So we're all on the same page because we all know um, sometimes certain, certain individuals like to drive a wedge into various spots in the conversation, which we, we don't want, right? Because we're accountable to our clients. So when it comes to the insurers, what we're seeing in our market is, uh, well, at the end of the day, I am doing, and my team is doing our best to provide all of the documentation to these insurance professionals, because let's face it, they're on the other side of the coin. They have someone else they have to answer to. And so if we do our part, we provide photo documentation, OEM position statements, scans, whatever they need to do to make their job easier. That's what helps build a stronger relationship. Because at the end of the day, they're boxed in, they can only do certain things. And if they, well, if we pay for that or this, you know, they're going to get written up or fired, lose their bonus, whatever that may be. So again, I look at it as the, the collaboration in the sense that we do our job to thoroughly document all this, give them their information that they need. And then it would be, at, it's at their discretion. It's their choice, right? I don't know what their client, I don't know what's in their insurance policy. You know, at the end of the day, they're all very similar, I'm sure, from what I've been told. You know, but uh, in Kansas, basically, if the vehicle's 12 months old or has more than 12,000 miles, by Kansas law, chapter 40 here, yeah, I've got it highlighted, Mark. Um, <laughs> that being said, there's really nothing in there to protect the consumer. And so what they do is they'll take our janitor repair assessment, cut it up, and they're paying anywhere from roughly 78 to 83 cents on the dollar. I think we all know that they're not keeping up with labor rates, um, material rates, the list goes on. Yep. So, so I believe our relationships are, are good, or I should say as best as they can be. Um, because at the end of the day, we're the humble service providers. We're following the OE guidelines on how to provide a safe and proper repair for our consumers. And if I've done my job, if my team has done their job properly on the front side, the consumer is right there with us. And like we've explained to them, it's like, I can be the squeaky wheel all day long, but it doesn't matter. I can file a complaint with the Kansas, Kansas Insurance Commissioner, which we've done. It doesn't go anywhere. The consumer has to be the one that knows their rights, fights for their rights, and knows just as much if not more than the insurance professionals. And so again, that's, that's our focus is really managing those expectations on the front side. And if they want us to help navigate that conversation, I will go all the way with them. I will go to court with them if it comes, if it comes to that point. And I have done that with an insurer two months ago. I'll show it real quick, but yes, I have it framed hanging on my wall in my customer's waiting area because I need them to understand how serious what we do. Let's face it, guys, what we do is right up there with brain surgery. And so our team wears scrubs. We have our mission statement on the back of the shirts as well. And it's like, this is the image we're conveying to our clients as well as the insurance professionals that we take this very seriously. And if you choose to short pay your client, that's fine. Just two questions. What are you choosing? What are you choosing not to pay for? And why are you choosing not to pay for it? And then we sit back and let them make that call. So I know that's probably the long winded version there guys, but um, as you can see, I'm very passionate about this. And I know every, I, I can see the faces in the room there. You guys are passionate as well, but it's like, all we gotta do is manage our customers' expectations and then if the insurer chooses to pay 50, 60, 98 cents on the dollar, that's their choice. But we just let them know up front that there will likely be a short pay and we will not know that 
until the very end of the conversation. So Jay, um, thank you for that opportunity. I'll, let me give that back. Let me give the floor to uh, to someone else. I, I see Rob's shaking his head, so maybe Rob wants to <laughs> keep it rolling here. No, uh, it's all the same. Uh, you know, you, you you know, we all set it up uh, at the beginning with the guest, and especially uh, today, I think it's worse than it's ever been before uh, with the pushback. Uh, and a downward pressure from insurers, uh, coupled with uh, their increasing lack of knowledge uh, mm. of, of how, you know, keep in mind, our job is to repair the vehicle, their job is to fund the repair. Let's not confuse our roles. And, uh, you know, we're basically having to tell everybody there is going to be out of pocket unless you have this company, this company, or this company, those cars are gonna to go to the front of the line because I know they're gonna get paid in full and on time and they go right through the system. If you have any of these other ones, it's, uh, it's, it's not gonna be a lot of fun for anybody. Anyone else like to add anything? I'll jump in. Sure. No, I, is, you know, James, and obviously, Rob's alluded to many of the challenges we face, but I, I want to go back to what James says, qualifying the customers, everything, knowing their expectations, when the claim starts, you know, solves a lot of issues. You know, knowledge is power. Uh, if you know your state's laws and stuff like that, you know, you can basically highlight what their rights are and uh, what's going to happen during the insurance repair process. Uh, there are some carriers we do not do work with. Uh, in those cases, we tell the consumer that we provide everything that they need to go back to the uh, insurer and give them the bill. And many of our customers uh, are affluent, highly educated, uh, multiple car policies, their business, their house, umbrella, everything. So they use that leverage sure. to some degree. The other thing we do is we try to obviously when there is a problem uh, have documentation. We we try to do as much email correspondence so that we have proof of what they said that there, there, there's no finger pointing. And luckily, we do have a department of insurance that has been really receptive. Uh, if we help them file a consumer complaint, we give all the information during the repair process, all the statements, repair procedures. And I can't tell you how many percentage of the time that uh, they get reimbursed, but we do get calls back from customers saying that, hey, we got to ch check back from the insurer. And we know we're on the right track when, when some of the supervisors from these companies call and say, hey, what can we do so that you don't keep filing these complaints? And surprisingly for the shop owners out there, the disappointing thing is when we used to file these complaints, the, the Department of Insurance says, hey, you know, there's only like 13 or 20 shops in, in California that, that, that complain. Hmm. And it's just surprising. And I want to let the shop owners know that, hey, we need your help. If there's injustice going on, file the complaint on your consumer's behalf. Uh, it, it, it doesn't go on deaf ears. So it's one of those situations where, unfortunately, it's part of doing business. We, we hate it. Uh, there should be less stress in our life. We just want to repair cars properly. And, uh, you know, the last thing I got to say is, hey, these some of the word tracks out there that are so deceptive that, uh, you know, we keep a track of them. And obviously, you know, litigation you know, could be a, a, a resource. But, you know, keep in mind, the, the, as far as the steering is concerned, where they pull cars out of the shop, we can do the same thing. We, we refer customers to the good insurers that work in our fair. So, you know, hey, right back at you. Yep. Well said, Kai. I mean, James, I think summarized it all. I mean, in terms of all the challenges that we're facing and the Rob and Kai had some great comments too. I mean, at the end of the day, we're responsible for a safe and proper repair for the customer. The liability is on our shoulders and we're the experts in terms of how to repair the vehicles, not insurance. Insurance, their job is to make the customer whole. And so whenever possible, we try to encourage the customers to ask their insurance company to get on a three-way call with us to walk through the repair procedures. So the insurance company is telling the customer at that time what they're not paying for and why. They don't like to do that, but um, whenever possible, um, that's the best way to really get 
a fair settlement for that customer. Um, and we do have some cases where some of the insurance companies are kind of steering the customers away and saying, you might have to pay out of pocket. You know, if you take your car to the shop and we try to educate our customers that, you know, not all shops are created equal and we invest in our certifications and we invest in equipment and we want to make sure that we're repairing your vehicle the right way where it's not about the dollar. It's about making sure your vehicle is whole again. And so, you know, there are customers who will say, that's okay. I'm not interested. And, in, you know, in that, that's not what I want. I just want my car to move down the street. Um, I want to be able to drive it. I don't care if it's back to, you know, pre-accident condition. But a lot of customers, once you educate them, they do. They say, okay, I know this is, I'm in the right place and you're going to take care of me. And so that time up front is so important with the customers. So they understand and try to pull in that insurance company. So and the other thing is with labor rates, you know, the labor rates are really suppressed in most of our markets. I mean, some, you know, for decades haven't even moved at all. Definitely not keeping up with the rate of inflation. Meanwhile, we need to make sure that we're paying our teams fairly for the jobs that they're doing. And we need to make sure we're investing in their education. So, um, so it's really not fair, honestly, because when you look at skill sets for these technicians to repair the vehicles. I mean, you're, we're asking a lot of them. And so they should be paid fairly and therefore we should be compensated correctly from insurance so we can pay our team fairly. So it's a challenge that we're all dealing with today, I know. Uh, you're, you're spot on there, uh, Cheryl. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, speaking about uh, word tracks specifically, um, I do want to do a shout out to um, Barrett Smith. Some of you guys are maybe familiar with him with auto damage experts in Florida. He has helped us tremendously. Uh, in fact, there's so much information out there with him. Um, I cannot physically digest it or not physically, I should say. Um, but we use, I mean, he's really helped guide us and help us. Uh, hold to our footing, hold to where we need to be as shop owners. And like what you're saying, I mean, each one of us as business owners, our cost of doing business is different, right? And so we all just figure out what that is, cost per square foot, put our posted rates up. That's what we charge, right? And so, um, yeah, Barrett's helped us tremendously with that word tracking. And then the one other thing that we use in the conversation piece with our clients and, it, and adjusters is uh, National Auto Body Research and Labor Rate Hero. I don't know if anyone's uh, using that. Those guys, we met them, I think four years ago at an ACOAT uh, regional performance group meeting. And it really opened my eyes to being able for us all to share um, information on claims that's been scrubbed but the information's out there that shows, you know, we can select by, by city, state, area. It shows, yes, they do pay for these things that are required and necessary for safe and proper repair. So that's just something else building on what Cheryl was saying. That's just another tool in our toolbox uh, that has helped us as, as shop owners communicate with these insurers that, hey, you do pay for these things. And okay, so it happened in in Denver. It happened near Rob, where you paid for it. Well, unless you consider my client a second class citizen, because the accident happened here in Kansas as opposed to Colorado. Well, you've got three things to do. Very simple: verify the damages, confirm the damages go to this claim, sell the claim by indemnifying the client. So yes, thank you for bringing that up, Cheryl. I I, I kind of forgot about some of that. And you bring up a good point, James. Uh, you know, you said, uh, Barrett, uh, we all need to have outside resources that we can lean on. Uh, you know, and you know, it's a toolbox of a lot of different tools. We use people for appraisal clauses for our guests. We use people for diminished value claims for our guests. We have to have that support system because we can't take all this on ourselves, but we can we can direct them to the people that will help them 
mitigate their damages beyond what the insurer is ready to pay for if, if they're not ready to pay in full. Uh, and, and you have to have those extra tools uh, to provide the guest. 100% Rob, yeah. We need all the support and all the tools in the toolbox we can garnish uh, to help educate and inform our clients as well as help the insurers you know, do their job to the best of their ability as well. Right, right. All great points. Uh, I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about our next topic, and that's a challenge for our industry. How are you recruiting and retaining technicians? And Rob, can we start with you on that? Uh, sure. Uh, first off, you know, we, we call it a technician shortage. It's a people shortage. It's every position uh, in, in the in the shop. Uh, I, I don't care if we're talking about a receptionist, a a manager, an estimator, and the people working on the cars. And everything that we're working on the cars today are so specialized. Uh, you know, we're, we're no different than everybody else on the call. We go through these struggles of uh, people leaving, people that uh, we've invested in dearly, uh, not only financially, but, you know, every other way. And you know, for us, they're not leaving to go work at other at other shops. They're a leaving the industry, or leaving you know Colorado and and moving to another state. Um, so it's a constant challenge. And you know, again, I don't care who you are on the call. You're you're going to be experiencing it if you're not right now. Um, Might for me, what works is you know we kind of have. You, it, it's about the personality of the shop, if you will. And everybody on this call, all your shops, you, you have a personality, you're known locally, you know, what are you known for though? And you got to really work on those strengths and, and, and make it known. Uh, and if you can, you know, be on social media, whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook or groups or, or whatever else, if you have a presence that makes people want to reach out to you to, to work for you, that's a great place to start. Because putting ads in papers and adding, you know, given, you know, saying, you know, we'll pay you a dollar more an hour to come work for us. There, there's no future in any of that anymore. Those days are, you know, they work for some people, but, you know, we all have uh, cultures that we develop in our businesses. Certain people will fit, certain people won't fit. And, uh, you know, I just think it's, it's really important to, to pay attention to that and, uh, and, and provide a place where somebody wants to come to work to. That, that's my initial reaction to the question. James, would you like to talk about that, son? Sure, um, just building on what Rob's already started there, uh, the key is culture, like he said. I think we can all agree. You want to provide that environment where people are drawn to, the right people are drawn to. Their pieces will fit your puzzle, so to speak. But beyond that, you're providing them that opportunity that, you know, reminding them that the sky is the limit, that you want them to continue to grow, to succeed, to learn more than we do. Because let's face it, I think for the most of us that are owners or managers, we don't, we're not going to do this forever. You know, I, I don't envision myself rolling around in the wheelchair, dragging an oxygen tank because I painted for 36 years, right? I, you know, we, we need to have that succession plan in place. And when we stick to like what Rob says, that creating that, that culture and we're drawing the right people at the right time, uh, that is just a huge part of what we're doing. Uh, we have... I've almost forgone all normal advertising measures, uh, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, um, any of the social media stuff. Um, I, again, I'm using my BNI Global Network and I am recruiting from outside the United States. Hmm. And so I am looking um, at bringing a technician over from the United Kingdom, Scotland specifically. I've spoken to technicians in Belarus. I've spoken to technicians in Kenya. Um, if they don't fit my puzzle, if they're more of the mechanic side or any of the other trades that are struggling with, like Rob said, people, then 
I looked at as my obligation to connect those people, help connect the dots for everyone else that's struggling as well. Um, so yeah, um, so it's twofold. So I'm looking outside the US um, and then also, albeit we're, we're a smaller facility than maybe many of the others on the call, uh, I have stepped back and I, I am doing more in-house training with the younger technicians. Kind of like what Rob said as well, it's, it, it's challenging. Let's face it, we know 16 hour days are, I'm not getting any younger, so um, I feel the pain a little more, but it's worth it, right? It's like we all talk about the skills gap in the United States. You hear micro talk about it day in, day out. It's like, well, we have two choices. We can sit around and complain about it. We can step up and make a difference in our industry. And will we see those changes in our lifetime? I don't know. But unless we start pouring into these young people who really are curious and are inquisitive and they're like, yeah, I think this may be for me, that, that's our um, obligation to them is to make sure that they, we can afford them that opportunity. Um, there's a quote, and I, I forget where I've heard it before, but it's something about, and I think maybe Cheryl talked about it, about um, you know, investing in people, all right? So it's like, do we train people and they leave or do we not train people and they stay, right? Amen. So it's 6108 the other day, but like, but like Rob said, and I'll, I'll, I'll get off on this one here, is that, um, yeah, that's what we're seeing here. Um, I have technicians that are retiring, you know, they're in their late 60s, they've earned it. Um, and same thing, people are just completely leaving the industry. And so we're, I think we're all on a similar page here, but uh, yeah, just think outside the box. Any of the business owners or, or managers on the call, Think outside the box. Think bigger than what you have before. So, great question. Thank you, Jay. Um, I, I'd say I, you know, I, I am concerned about you know getting younger people excited about this industry. And I think as a whole, it's really on all of us to educate kids in middle school and their families, so their families are supporting them in these trades and the skills. Um, I will say I was very encouraged last week, Skills USA was in Atlanta, um, and I got to participate on um, the interviews for the, uh, for the uh, collision repair industry, and um, I think there were approximately 100 different kids that we got to interview, and it was so exciting to see their passion and how excited they are about their skills and the trade. Um, I hear someone's alarm going off for a uh, some kind of alarms going off for somebody. But anyway, it was very encouraging to see how excited they were. And then their, their professors are with them too and how excited they were. So that gave me like renewed um, encouragement for you know, kids coming into our industry. But I think it's so important that as an industry, we support people. So if they come on and join a shop that A, they get into the right shop. So Rob, you talked about culture, James too. Making sure that we're placing these um, you know, new graduates from Botech schools or right out of high school, we're placing them in the right environment. They find the right culture where they're being supported and where they're able to grow and that they can stay in the industry. We don't wanna get people in the industry and then they have a bad experience and then we lose them for life. Um, Cause this industry, the sky is the limit. So there's so many areas to get involved in um, and we need to let them to see that career path can be whatever they want that career path to be. Um, and we do have a, an app, a people development app, so that our, our team, everyone on our team, no matter what their skill levels are, can go through and understand and learn a little bit more about each process and then help them develop to move to that next level. And we really wanna develop our team with them. Now, sure, we have people who leave and that's just, you know that, that does happen, but our goal is to really help develop our team with them and, and help and retain them for life within our company or the industry. Kai, anything to add? Of course, uh, you know, great points, everyone. Uh, you know, obviously the job fairs are a key element. Uh, there's a lot of uh, new, new uh, young people coming into maybe not even our industry uh, and never even considered our industry. And to be able to get out in front of them and give them that proposal, hey, did you ever think about using this as a career path is great. A lot of them, uh, like I said, never even considered it. Uh, personally, you know, 
I'm sure with all of you, we've got employees wearing more than one hat, just trying to make up for the shortages. Um, you know, one thing that we've done is actually move people from out of different departments in and fill areas that we were looking for and finding that wherever they came from was easier to fill. So that that was another situation that kind of helped out. Sometimes we're, we're focused on one one item and not looking at the whole picture. Uh, that's what we've done. Obviously, we also reach out to family members that work for us. We, we've got a couple of father and son teams uh, that have worked out good. Uh, mainly some, some, th- some of the dads goes, hey, I want to keep an eye on my kid and, and, and give him a trade. Uh, my wife and I also sponsor a faith-based recovery uh, homes and uh, we work with the men's ministry. And there are people out there that suffer addiction that are good people. They just need another chance. So it, it, you know, like the James, you know, just think, thinking out of the box and, uh, you know, doing the community of service and giving these men another opportunity, um, you know, sometimes helped. Have we got a superstar out of it? No, but we've actually, you know, helped change some lives and, uh, and has actually helped us. So those are a couple of the things that we've done. Appreciate that, everyone. I know we're right at time, but I wonder if we could just touch on one quick question from the audience. We can't discuss any pricing, uh, any specific pricing, but with inflation at all-time high, is anyone here seeing us pushing for increases on labor and material rates in their areas? <laughs> James? Yeah, yeah. Hey, can, you, can you say the question again? Was it, are we seeing shops push for those rates or, or insurers? Do you know of any shops that are pushing for these rate increases? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we're we're leading the pack in our market. Okay. And that's, yeah. And so again, that's where it's up to each and every business owner to sit down, look at your numbers because we know how quickly they're changing. We know like clockwork, our, our paint manufacturers take an average of a 7% increase year over year. I think last year, I think we got hit with a, with a 15% increase, if I recall correctly. So you really got to pay attention to the numbers, pay attention to your overhead on all those dynamics because like Cheryl was talking about is the, the cost of uh, labor. It's we have to pay more to get the technicians. And there's so many, so many dynamics that are key to doing that. So yes, we've um, analyzed your numbers, and then get on to National Auto Body Research and share your information because that's how you elevate. That's how we, you know, all boats rise with the tide, something like that. Yep. You know, we've all heard it. Well, you're the only one in your market. You're the only one doing this. Don't be the only one. It, it has nothing to do with collaboration. Just look at your business and then plug your numbers in. Hey, th- these are our posted rates. And when everyone begins to do that, you won't be the only one and everyone will succeed. Yeah, the tag on the tag on to what James was saying, you know, it's obviously we're on a business not to lose money. And so there's sometimes you just have to say no to those jobs. Uh, it's obviously the consumers vehicles that we're working on. And if we got to pass on the additional uh, charges, we, that's what we do. Yeah. And it's all done up front. So we, we can only do what we can do. Anyone else like to add anything? Yeah, you know, labor, any kind of rate, uh, to tell you the truth, is, you know, that's a, that's a business decision you need to make uh, for yourself and not necessarily just accept, you know, X insurers paying $2 more an hour. You know, $2 more an hour may not be enough for you, maybe more than enough for you. Uh, Take that out of it and figure out what's right for your business and what it costs to do business the way you do business uh, and, and, and price it appropriately and don't be apologetic about it. Uh, you know, it's, exactly. you know we, we all spend a lot of money in equipment and, and incredible training. And uh, I mean, hell, every single thing that we touch is going up. I mean, I got a trash company that picked up, you know, a big 30-yard thing, 
drives it two, two miles down the road, well, now they're charging a gas surcharge of $200. Mm. So, you know, it comes from every, every angle and you really need to know what your costs are today. And I promise you, you're, they're changing every day, if not every week. Yeah, and we've, we've taken the effort, like we've updated our door rates and, you know, posted those, making sure they're clear for all of our consumers and for the insurance companies, um, because our cost, like everyone else on the call, has gone up and we want to make sure it's clear. And when an insurance company says that's not what the market's charging, well, we're not the market. Right. And not all shops are, you know, performing safe and proper repairs. So it's a it's a battle, but we all have to, like, like James said, and Rob and Kai, we all have to fight it together. I mean, we all really have to stand, you know, stand firm with the rates and not just give in. So otherwise it will never change. We'll be looking at the same labor rate in 20 more years. So 